I want to give you just an example of what we've done in the inflammation space. And the point you made, Chris, actually Janet and I are directors of an institute that sits embedded in the hospital, in the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. And it's interesting the psychological change it makes to people because scientists like Kit and clinicians like cohorts. And actually, if you see the clinicians understanding how top quality science can be done right next door to where the scientists are seeing patients every day of their life with a disease that they're trying to, to deal with. It's a hugely important thing, and I, and I mention it because, if anything, the direction is completely the other way. You know, the Crick is a fantastic institute, but it hasn't got a hospital in it. Um, and it, you have to, at some point, decide, are you going to put all the best scientists into one institute and create brilliant scientists, and all the clinicians into another place? And at what point will they ever bump into each other and talk to each other and get new ideas? So actually, I'm trying to walk a difficult tightrope because I'm actually employed by two organizations. Half my salary comes from Birmingham, half my salary comes from Oxford, to set up this thing here, set up actually with philanthropic funding from the Kennedy Trust for Rheumatology Research to address what I think is a fundamentally important uh, question, um, which is what, is the what are the processes that drive disease? Uh, and you'll see in a minute um, we have a problem. And the problem is this, the smartest minds in the world, the scientists work in this silo here, which is all about mechanism. So if you have your PhD hat on, mechanism, mechanism, all about dose response, it's causal. So when I go into the laboratory, I happen to have got a PhD and an MD, I go into the laboratory, I'm in causal mode. I want to show A causes B. And people like genes because genes are causal. The trouble is when I practice medicine, I got, at least in the diseases I deal with, with the exception of, of, of diseases such as cancer, where we know genes are, certain genes are causal, and also infectious diseases where we can isolate the organism. Most of the diseases here on this side, uh, I work with a correlative hat on. I'm trying to correlate. And remember, these constructs here called rheumatoid arthritis, Sjogren syndrome, are human classifications. They're not biologically, they have no biology underpinning them. They're a set of physicians who come together and say, here's a diagnostic set of criteria that I'm going to call this. Um, and so we have, if I asked those of you in the audience, um, you know, at this point, we make drugs against these things, but we pay, put our readouts at this point, and there's a disconnect. And the problem is the disconnect becomes actually very important. And the hypothesis I want to propose to you is that's the missing bit that I think will transform medicine. And why am I excited about doing medicine is because I think the human cell atlas will transform the way we think about doing medicine. So if I ask Chaz how many genes are there in the human genome, go back just before the turn of the last century, people were guessing about how many there would be. There were bets put on it. There are 20,000, plus or minus, depends how you define it. But they're not 200,000, and they're not two. If I asked you how many organs there are in the human body, there are 80. Defining an organ as a set of cells which do something together, brain, lung, heart. But if I asked all of you sitting here now, how many individual cell types make up a brain, or a lung, or a kidney, you have no idea. Neither do I. And yet we're using drugs that have and their effect on a cell, and the cells make the organs. So no wonder we have a problem, because we're using drugs where we don't understand the cellular basis for the disease which we're trying to treat. So you argued earlier a little bit about understanding the cytokine basis. Is this a TGF beta? I would argue, what's the cellular basis by which this is occurring? Is this a B cell disease, a T cell disease, a neuronal disease, a macrophage disease? Is it a red cell disease? In other words, if you could reclassify away from the anatomical basis and the genetic basis to the underlying cellular basis of disease, now we would understand if I gave Chaz rituximab, it will deplete his B cells, and I can act in a causal realm. I know that whatever I then see must be because I've depleted a CD19 positive B cell. And sitting here, standing here as a rheumatologist, that's our contribution to where we are at the moment. We were able to get antibodies repurposed often from treating leukemias, anti-TNF, primary indications, sepsis, repurposed to rheumatoid arthritis. But we, people like Mark Feldman and Tiny Many had the guts to go and do experimental medicine to see where this would take them, but then they learned from it. So I would argue the next five years are going to be not big data. I think it'll all be about understanding the cellular basis of disease. So we will know the cell atlas. 
it'll be a bit like instead of going to the states using the Mapa Mundi, which is what we currently do, right, in this setup, we would actually have Google GPS. We would know exactly where we're going. We would know that there are 16 types of individual cells that make up a brain. In fact, there are more. There are 72. There are 24 that make up a placenta. Interestingly, the same cell type that you see in a placenta is ex identical to the one you see in the skin, now explaining why people who are treated with psoriasis get placental problems. Right? So if you understand the cellular basis, you can say there's a mechanism behind this because now I understand that this particular cell I see in this disease, and guess what? I see it in another disease. Now I reclassify that based not on this ridiculous taxonomy that's 200 years old and you know, was good at the time, but based on an anatomical one. It was better than before that when we had you know, the agues and, and rumors in the air that you breathed in and that's why you got disease. At least we moved to an anatomical basis, but we're siloed into specialties that are based on anatomy. The brain, neurologists, the joints, dermato rheumatologists, the skin, dermatologists. Biology doesn't give a damn about which organ you're in. It's about which cells make up that organ and therefore the proposal I'm trying to sell to you today is by understanding that we might make a step change. Of course, the null hypothesis is that's completely wrong, and then I will look a fool. But I'm prepared to take the step and be employed by two organizations to test this hypothesis formally. So what are we going to do? We don't call it stratified medicine. We call it stratified pathology. The problem with the current way we do disease is we make an artificial construct. We call it rheumatoid because it it is symmetrical, it's swollen, it's early morning stiffness. The only bit of biology we have is a bit of rheumatoid factor and CCP and ESR. Imagine if you had a breast lump and the oncologist squeezed it and said, according to how I squeeze, I'm going to give you Herceptin. That's partly what we're doing here in rheumatoid arthritis. The end point, the construct that we call rheumatoid arthritis has no biology in it at all. And even worse, we're in a linear scheme the regulators and everybody else says that you can only get a license to practice that drug unless you fulfill these criteria, which are disease activity score, squeeze it and it hurts. The American College of Rheumatology, not much better, and X-ray. And now, if I have a drug that changes those parameters, I can get a license for that disease. But I can't get a license for this disease because I've used different readouts for that disease. The reality is they share an awful lot in common. They, these two, rheumatoid arthritis and inflammatory bowel disease and spondyloarthropathy, respond to anti-TNF. Interesting, but Sjogren's doesn't, right? Rituximab works in MS, diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, myositis. These are new classifiers based on the, the intervention of the drug you're using and the cell that is being targeted or the process that's being targeted. And so what the ATAP, the Arthritis Therapy Acceleration Program, is trying to do in the inflammation space is what I'm suggesting you might want to do in the aging space because inflammation is a process and, it, you know, rheumatoid arthritis occurs in the joints but not the brain, but there's the inflammatory process that's similar in the joint and similar in the brain. Anti-TNF makes MS worse. That's telling you something about pathogenesis. So actually, you can turn your lemons into lemonade by using when drugs don't work by understanding why they didn't work. And that's what the ATAP has at its heart. And it uses a, a strategy design called basket trials and umbrella trials. I'll tell you a little bit more about them. But it, has, it says, here's Smarty. I'm going to target this red Smarty. If this red Smarty at a cellular basis is present in these diseases, I should see an effect based on the pathological changes. If, however, this disease, Sjogren's, only has that particular cell type that's not a process, it's not shared in the others, I'll only see an effect in Sjogren's. So a basket trial is one drug, many diseases or many indications. An umbrella is the other way around. That's classical StratMed. We have basically one disease, rheumatoid, five different treatments, which one is working best for which type of patient. Now, everybody and their dog's trying to do that. Good luck to them. But we're setting our store up to answer this particular question, because we think if we can do that, then we'll understand about why drugs fail as well as why they succeed. Here's the structure. Cohorts are kings. Biomarkers are beggars. Data is dynamite. Right? But curated cohorts of patients, we were talking earlier about what the NHS brings. It brings a huge workforce of very engaged people who just want to be loved. Right? And the clinicians beautifully curate boutique cohorts. I don't want 10,000 patients. I'm not going to learn anything from 10,000 patients. The cellular basis will tell me, actually, I need very few. And here comes the rub. 
because I practice medicine in a Bayesian way. I take into account the past medical history, but all our trials are based on p-values, not on Bayesian calculations. And the moment you switch to no placebo, but a comparator arm that's another disease, you can introduce that type of, of stratification, that type of statistics. And a Bayesian approach drops your numbers of patients required from 100 down to 10 in each arm. And I can show you the power calculations by which we do that. So it's four diseases. We have these work packages, cohorts are kings, and the biomarkers attached to them. We have John Deeks, who's a world expert in understanding how these uh, biomarkers, which are actually are in the tissue, not the blood. The trial design has to be innovative and is done in a very special way, which I'll show you. And then how we integrate the data in a non-threatening way. We use a system which is the industry standard called Transmart that allows the curators of these cohorts to deposit their data and they only can see rheumatoid, and if they want to share it with me with Sjogren's, they can share it, but they don't have to. And they can keep in their silo or they can share if they wish. And this system has been used, in fact, Jan Janssen were the first to use it, it is now an industry standard, to collect this kind of data. Not just clinical data, but actually uh, the cellular basis and genetic basis. I, uh, I told you earlier, it's all about getting tissue. The truth is in the tissue. Uh, people told us 10 years ago this was gonna be impossible. Uh, patients wouldn't like it. Not only do they, not, do they like it, because actually washing out their joint makes them better, but they come back for sometimes two or three biopsies. So you can do a time course. You can have a patient with rheumatoid, you biopsy the joint, you give a drug intervention, you biopsy again. And then you look and see what has changed in that joint, because that's where you want to see the change. The cohorts that I showed you there in rheumatoid arthritis are equivalent here in Sjogren's. We biopsy the lip. I've had my lip biopsy twice. It's not that awful. And patients with Sjogren's have dry mouth, but they heal perfectly fine. And in fact, we got patient, uh, some of our colleagues from Novartis because we did one of the trials with them. And you were mentioning earlier about uh, scientists, colleagues in industry, never been in a hospital except as a patient or see their relative. They came and saw our patients and were really surprised by the fact that they wanted to have these biopsies. They wanted to take part in trials. And when we started those trials, they were all talking about this. Gosh, have you gone into the Novartis trial? because it was a biopsy arm where they knew that they were contributing something more than just actually uh, uh, you know, a routine um, visit. So this is called OASIS, this cohort. The other two cohorts are strong in Oxford because we have to get equality. So Birmingham has rheumatoid and Sjogren's and they're strong in those. They also both have autoantibodies in them. These other two are very strong in Oxford. The spondyloarthropathies, including the eye, the skin, the anthesis. I don't know if you've ever thought Patients with uh, uh, spondyloarthropathy, ankylosing spondylitis, I don't know how many of you are physicians, but you wouldn't pass your medical exams if you didn't know if you had a patient with ankylosing spondylitis to listen at the left sternal edge and to look in the eyes. Now, why are you doing that? So my clinical colleagues are doing this every day of their life in clinics now, and yet they're not asking what's the cellular basis for why I'm doing this. When you chat to them, and you find out these lovely golden oldies that you need to know to pass the MRCP exams, turns out that that site is where tendons insert. How do you move your eyes? You move it with a tendon, right? End of a muscle. That's an anthesis. It's just different to the anthesis that you've got in your Achilles heel. But blow me down. It's the same bloody T cell at the front of the eye in uveitis as it is at the anthesis in ankylosing spondylitis, responding to R23, making R22, right? And those are done by actually taking human eye, taking out some fluid, doing single cell sequencing on it and comparing it to what you see at the sacroiliac joint. And when you explain to patients why we need their tissue, they're lining up for it because they realize the model is broken. And looking at the blood is like trying to work out what the traffic is in the middle of London by surveying the M25. If you want to know the traffic in London, go to the middle of London. Don't survey the traffic in the M25. So these are very smart clinician scientists looking at actually, interestingly here, and you talked earlier, uh, actually, Chaz, about how you repurpose a drug. Takeda killed off the anti-GMCSF program. A small company set up to go and buy the asset, make the antibody themselves, and they're running this now as a trial of 70 patients using anti-GMCSF repurposed from IBD to ankylosing spondylitis based on this population of cells being there before and after. And we can power against a change, a probabilistic change in that population of cells. We don't know if the patients will get better. It's not powered for clinical efficacy, but it's powered against a change in that pathology. 
The final cohort is the TGU, the, the IBD cohort in Oxford. And again, you can see how joined up uh, the approach is there. So what are the endpoints in these clinical trials? Well, I told you earlier, they're not clinical. These patients who are coming in at phase 1b, 2a, we hope that in 10 patients there may be a spectacular clinical advance. Sometimes you get it, like anti-TNF. But actually, we want to know, did the drug get into the tissue and make a difference? And so only with four markers, that's all we need, Chaz, four biomarkers, I can tell the difference between osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis over six patients on a biopsy. This is routine histology, immunofluorescence. And I won't tell you what the markers are, but you can see here in the lining layer and the sublining layer, they're anatomically in a different place, and in the lining layer and sublining layer. It's nice to know where the cells are, but you need to quantify them. And people are quantifying in the blood every day of the, of, in every hospital. This is what happens in clinical routine immunology labs, where you quantify using flow cytometers. And, yeah, and the regulators are very keen for these outcomes because they're standardized, used in leukemias all the time. What we do here is something called liquid histology. We digest the tissue and count the number of cells, give the drug, digest the tissue, and count the number of cells and see what the change is. And that's the pilot studies that are happening now to power then the future change to see what would happen in some of the studies we're doing anti-TNF in rheumatoid arthritis before and after biopsy, anti-TNF, the same drug, adalimumab, in inflammatory bowel disease before and after biopsy. 20 patients each arm, no placebo, it's standard of care. The cost is actually not the drug because it's standard of care, the cost is in the analysis. And we're looking to see who are the responders and non-responders, what's the cellular basis, is there a shared cell that's present in the gut and in the joint that is responsible for when you see a response versus not a response. You can use imaging endpoints, and these actually are quite powerful. This is a PET scan of a particular marker in one of the stromal cells. In, an, in a person, um, you can see the normal joints aren't involved. Here's the shoulder, and here's the knees. So you could use exactly the same. This is an anti-FAP antibody in rheumatoid and in inflammatory bowel disease and in Sjogren's. And so you can have a shared outcome bit like CRP of the tissue or ESR of the tissue that would be common to all these sites. So that was the vision. The Kennedy Trust have funded it, seven million over the next seven years, and it's powered to do, uh, or allowed to do two studies per year. The first two studies are going through, first one is spinal tap, the second one is torus, and now companies are starting to get interested in this cross comparison, particularly as we tell them, look, to do it, normally you would choose your drug, drug X, I've got disease indication Y, I do my trial, 20 million pounds, 19 out of 20 times, it fails. So what if we de-risked it down to you that actually instead of going into that trial now with one disease, you go in with four and you go into a basket trial. And I'll show you how that's done because you have to decide what you're going to use as entry point into the basket criteria. This is used routinely now in rarer diseases and of course in cancer, where we borrowed that, that from. We have two fantastic clinical trials units, one in, in, in Birmingham, led actually by a pediatric oncologist, and Ben Fisher is the clinical lead for that. And then Duncan Richards, who's just moved from GSK to Oxford uh, with Sally Lamb. And these basically help us design how we do these basket trials. Have a look at your umbrellas and your baskets if you're interested. This is a great review. But in essence, it's a single disease. You screen for the presence of something particular. In this case, it might be autoantibodies. So you're going to have rheumatoid. Sjogren's, inflammatory uh, muscle disease, any disease where you've got autoantibodies, you put them in and you say, okay, my drug I know targets B cells. Now I put them in these different uh, components and I ask before and after what has happened. And this powers then the companies to say, we got a hit and we got a hit in the tissue and it makes sense and now we move seamlessly because the regulators allow us not to stop the trial and start again. You have an adaptive trial design. Basically you stop at this point, you kill off the two diseases where you didn't see an effect and you carry on with the one that you did into a bigger cohort. And so that's a uh, uh, basket uh, trial. The umbrella trial is the other way around. So you have a single disease and you screen now um, uh, with a series of different uh, drug interventions. Um, and these have revolutionized the way in which we practice medicine. It's cut the number of patients you need. And when you have a bolt-on bit of biology, it's been very informative. What about the regulators? 
Well, it's great to start with a drug that hasn't, a disease that hasn't got an approved drug like Sjogren's, uh, approved uh, therapy, because actually the regulators now are using, allowing us to use our histological readouts as endpoints in clinical trials. And they're coming to us and saying, we, you know, we are just in the same problem as you. We realize the system is broken. Suggest to us what you want to do. And as long as it's safe, we'll engage with you. And so this was a combined European grouping, the EULA, European League Against Rheumatism, coming together and saying, actually, the endpoint in clinical trials for Sjogren's disease has to be defined in this way. Not asking the patient, how many tears do you have and how dry your mouth is, which is so subjective. Yeah? And so this now has become, as part of an IMI, is going to be tested in formal trials to see how robust it is. So I end just a little bit about aging, because you've got the same problem that we have. Inflammation is a process. Aging is a process. It's normal. Without inflammation, you die, right? So the question is, how are you going to get at these issues we were discussing earlier? What are the processes that you're going to target? And then I think I would just have a go at it. You're not going to know till you have the guts to put it into somebody and have a go. A bit like anti-TNF and see what you see, but carefully collect the information that you need and the cellular basis by which you think it's going to work. Because without that, then you're ending up in problems. Otherwise, it's too big to eat the elephant all in one bite. So there are many processes that are involved in aging, but they're not infinite, right? So you know some of them, and you've got drugs that target them. So why not have a go? Here are potentially some of them, um, and, but they're not, again, you know, an infinite number. There's senescent cells, autophagy, different signaling pathways, epigenetic changes, telomerase. These are well validated. They're drugs that target them. The trick will be, should you do a basket and try one type of disease where it's a joint, another one where it's a, a skin, another one where it's a brain, yeah, and try it that way? Or are you just going to put all comers in and try and do 2,000 patients? I can't give you advice on that, but I'm just saying that there are a number of different ways you could think about it. Metformin? Here, you, I mean, this is heresy now, but you could argue we have so many drugs. Do we really need new ones? We just need to know how to use the ones we've got, right? Of course, we need new drugs for certain other indications. But until we know the cellular basis of disease, how are we going to apply the drugs that we have to something that's logical? Because we have an endpoint that's clinical, but actually a target that's a, a protein, and we don't know the intervening bit. So again, mice are not men. They lie. Mice lie and monkeys exaggerate when it comes to clinical trials, right? Um, and the reality is that you have to just, you know, it takes guts to do experimental medicine without any disrespect to my Oxford employers, right? I can, I'm going to tickle them a little bit because there's a, a kind of joke, you know. Oxford does translational medicine. It does it beautifully. But translational medicine is not experimental medicine. It stops at the point where you've shown cause, some causality. What Birmingham does really well, and it takes balls to do it, is put the drug into humans. And experimental medicine is that. You take the next step. That's why I love the consortium that I'm working with, because I get the best of the best science and the best of the best experimental medicine. And that's the dream ticket. And you can't do it with one or t'other. And actually, they're two very different sisters. You know, one's 1,000 years old. The other one is only 120 years old. But they have different strengths. And it's that at that tension of that joined up, that you get new and exciting things. And this is, of course, the ITAC that uh, is the brainchild of, of those in the room. But I think the next step is you've got to stop having philosophy. You've got to actually get on and do it. And who knows whether you're going to be right. But what I tell you is fortune favors the brave. But if you're going to do those studies, for goodness sake, capture all the biology and the cell biology before and after anti-TNF single cell sequencing, before and after rituximab single cell sequencing. That's what we've been doing on 10 patients. And you only need tiny numbers. And you, you know, a couple of weeks ago, three patients with inflammatory bowel disease, a brand new cell type in the bowel that, where all the GUS hits for inflammatory bowel disease coalesce on that senses pH. Three patients is all it took. Cells don't lie, and you don't need thousands of them to see a big difference. We need a new approach. I don't need to tell you this. This is the valley of death, right? And that's the problem. If you mention to any uh, chief executive of a pharma company 3.6, they'll quiver in their boots because that's the return, average return on investment in pharmacy, pharmaceutical industry now. Of course, there's some with big and some with little, but it's not sustainable. And that's because drugs don't fail for lack of uh, for problems with safety. We have good regulators, but they fail for lack of efficacy. 
And the problem is we keep throwing the ball against the wall when we ought to just go around the wall and throw the ball on the other side. And these are, don't require industry to solve these problems. This is a medical profession problem. And one of uh, how we, inter you know, that's why I asked the question earlier about the NHS university interface, because that's where these discussions have to happen, not between academia and industry. That, that ignores the patient completely. You can make all these assets, but if you don't trial them, put them into patients, how are you going to know whether they're going to get better? And this is the ATAP pipeline where, again, I would encourage you to get patient advocates. They're very good at making change happen. Nothing about us without us. Get them into your ITAC groups. Ask them what they really want. Uh, and, uh, you know, they're incredibly helpful and, um, and very insightful. Um, we, uh, often our patients will say to us, look, you know, now we understand why you're wanting to biopsy. You never explained it to us before. If you want to biopsy my gut, go ahead when we tell them that microbiome is also associated. And so we're doing interesting studies, giving deuterated water to patients with rheumatoid arthritis and looking at their guts and joints at the same time. Yeah. And, and these are things that actually, when you talk to patients, they say, well, if you don't do it now, who's going to do it? And actually the mice have been lying all this time. So let's get back to where the UK was really good in the 1960s at experimental medicine. You know, where were the proton pumps done? Where were, where were the, the scopes that went down in the 1970s and then along came cimetidine and you measured pH before and after? That was what the NHS was brilliant at in the 70s. The Hammersmith, Birmingham was actually one of the centers. Colin Dollery trained there. You know, we need to get back to that kind of cellular pharmacology now that we were really good at and we got diverted with genes and we need to get back to the cells and to get at these kinds of things. So I'll end just with a video. I don't know if Greg, if you're up there, if you could put it on. Um, it's a bit of shameless self-publicity, and I apologize for that. But, you know, one thing I have learned is if you want to engage industry, um, it's like a slippery eel. They're interested, but you've got to show them, firstly, that you, could, you can deliver. And secondly, it's always good to have a good video that tells the story, and you don't need to, to say it. So could you put it on for me, Gary? How do we make sure that the medical profession can adapt to a new taxonomy where we break down not just the boundaries between the bench and the bedside, but between bedside and bedside, between the ologies? Traditionally, the way we devise clinical trials is to try one drug, one disease, one outcome. If it doesn't work, we move on to the next disease with the same drug. But one of the ways you can innovate in clinical trial design is devising a new type of trial called a basket trial. In a basket trial, we're able to recruit patients with multiple different types of diseases all into one trial and evaluate one drug across all those diseases rather than running 10, 20 separate trials. When you do a basket trial that's based on a drug's biology, what you end up with at the end of the trial is a much more intelligent answer about not only whether the drug works, but in which patients does it work and why. What we're calling stratified pathology, the right drug for the right disease indication. From a patient's point of view, I think it's extremely important. Treating a marker like an inflammation makes a lot of sense. With diseases you look at you know what's causing them, what the effects are and how to treat that as opposed to looking at one of the core things which is in this particular instance the inflammation. It's taking four diseases, rheumatoid, Sjogren, spondylarthropathy, inflammatory bowel disease, and it's asking, can we come towards a new taxonomy based on the underlying processes? We have a huge opportunity now to apply everything that we've learned in how to design new drugs and develop them for cancer and start applying them within inflammatory diseases. And that's what the arthritis tap will bring. We really are in an age of a new way of doing research. But to be able to do that with an institute with such a strong history is really fantastic. The ATAP is launching now in September 2018, bringing together two institutions that have tremendous strengths of their own, Oxford and Birmingham, and seven NHS organisations that are linked to those universities. So we're working closely with clinical colleagues and developing a community that actually sees the value of the different ways of approaching disease research. We're now ready to really engage with the exciting future that the UK has in this area. And that future is all about experimental medicine, all about how the UK can offer something that's able to take us not just to the state of the art, but beyond the state of the art. It's a great place to be and to work in the UK. And we want industry to come and work in it, but we want them to use our NHS. And we want to engage the sleeping giants of the consultants in the NHS 
to tell us some of the interesting stories that they have and how we can best target drugs in this particular setting. Thanks for your attention. Thanks, Chris. I thought that was inspirational. And then sort of connecting the biochemical with the uh, medicinal and stuff of value society is exactly what we need to do. Uh, have we got any questions? Uh, and if we have any questions from either young people or people in patient group representatives, we'd be particularly keen to have those. I'm sure we do. Uh, thanks. Excellent talk. Um, I want to thank you for showing the hallmarks of aging diagram. So for those who uh, are not familiar with that sort of wheel denoting the fundamental primary causes of aging, it's from a paper called The Hallmarks of Aging, and I think it should really be sort of a guidepost for the field. I'm actually a venture capitalist, and we invest and build companies focused on those fundamental hallmarks of aging. And recently, with actually the senior author, Guido Cromer, who wrote that paper, um, because, you know, if we, can sl if we can target one of these hallmarks of aging, and you mentioned that some of these are already suitably targeted, but I'd argue others are not, such as genomic instability, right? We're able to induce genomic instability, but there are not a lot of groups pursuing enhancing stability. Anyway, so I think there's a lot of opportunity there. So thanks for bringing that up. Um, the, the question I have for you is about the human cell atlas. So what happens if you know, there are not discrete cell types, but it's actually sort of a continuous variable, and you get, you know, many different subtypes of cells within a given tissue. Okay, so this is a scientific question about states of activation and stages of differentiation. But what I would argue is that they're, uh, you know, inf they're not, uh, that the numbers of individual people we have in this room are individual, but we can sort them into male and female, and then there'll be some transgender. But the reality is you can sort into certain phenotypes that then you have to say the best definition of that cell is how it behaves. Now you're going to behave one way as you sit here, but you're the same person and you'll behave differently if you're at home or you know, on holiday. And the reality is we need to understand what it is that defines you as being an individual cell and how do you work in your community. So we heard a lot about changing cultures behaviorally. Actually, biological ecosystems are exactly the same. A cell coming in or leaving is a different, you know, the type of cell that it is, is going to define what it does. And I put it to you that there will be a finite number of cell types. We already know that. Go and open nature every week. That's why I said to you, 24 cells, individual cell types make a placenta. That was an article in Nature last year published by Sarah Teichman. They're not 25, they're not 22, they're 24. That's the total number of individual cell types that make up the human placenta. We've been funded by the MRC to do it for the joint. How many individual joint cells in the joint make up a joint? Cartilage, bone, anthesis, synovium. What, what, what's that number? If you were an X-ray crystallographer, it's the phase problem. Yeah, I need to know the individual, not, not the total number of cells, but the individual cell types. Yeah? And without that, we have a big problem because we can't, the marker is not the mechanism. And then you're constantly dealing with an endpoint in a clinical trial, which is a biomarker or it's a surrogate marker that sometimes gets divorced from the substantive marker. I don't know how many of you are, are epidemiologists, but there's a classic example of that. When I was training as a houseman and the thrombolysis trials were happening, right? And so th this was the big time of the ISIS trials of thrombolysis to, after myocardial infarction. And one of the problems is people were dying of ventricular arrhythmias afterwards. And so people used flecainide, and the biomarker was actually the ECG. An 80% drop in ventricular arrhythmias after postmyocardial infarction with thrombolysis, 80% drop in ECG. So they do the definitive trial, more people die on flecainide than not, because you've divorced the biomarker, the substantive biomarker at endpoint, which is death, from the biomarker that you're using. That's why I come back to Chaz's point. In these beautiful boutique cohorts of patients, you, you've collected them in a certain way, and you can basically get biomarkers that are truthful and are mechanistic and not kind of correlative. And so if I were a venture capitalist investing, I would invest, as in fact, Chan Zuckerberg are investing in the human cell atlas, because whoever holds those chapters has huge power, right? 
because they know the cellular basis of that particular organ. And in this human cell atlas, we have to look at the developing, development and adults. So you're mandated in the Wellcome Trust process and in fact in the MRC program to look at fetal development. Nobody's done fetal development of a human joint. Now we, we can do that in the UK. There are ethical ways of doing that through UCL and Newcastle. And you look at the markers and you say, okay, now I know how those cells are changing. And guess what? The mice lie. <laughs> because they don't have the same type of joints. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Very interesting talk. So in the spirit of knowledge exchange and open science, of course, you mentioned those four main indications that you'll be looking into your basset trial. But of course, there are lots of other diseases which can benefit from the results you are generating. Sometimes with biomarkers that you will, or some uh, data you'll be collecting when you interview patients, or even with the panel of a small difference, you can actually get data for all the indications. So what's your view of developing a platform that you can drive value from your four main interest diseases, but also making it open in a way that other diseases groups like yeah. vascular, so, so us. That's a great question. We've deliberately chose Transmart because that's the one being used by the MRC and the UK image Biobank. And so it allows us to use the same platforms. Otherwise, we'll end up like Macintoshes versus PCs, right? So we've deliberately chosen that because the, the problem is, you know, you, you get all these bioinformaticians to get, oh, I wouldn't write a database like that. I'll do it like this. You've got to start somewhere. So we're going to use that because it's non-competitive. Mm -hmm. And it was set up precisely to do that, uh, um, Transmart. And so that data will go in there. And I don't want to profiteer, but I do want to make a profit. The, the reason the, well, the, the, the Kennedy Trust, who are sitting on 300 million because of the patent of anti and methotrexate, are able to invest in this, is because they made some money from it. And I want to make some money back for them that we can reinvest as other diseases come. Mm -hmm. But without money, you can get nowhere. Yeah. So we do need, I don't, I, I don't want to profit here, but I do actually want to make a profit in order to reinvest it back in. And that data is powerful and it is, has a value to it. Um, that's really cool. Um, what did you have to do or what would it take to engage that sleeping giant of consultants that you mentioned for other indications? Or what, what's, what? You have to love them. You have to tell them actually they're good and what they do matters and that they're not just an algorithm. Is that all? You'd be amazed. <laughs> so, so actually the problem is not just with them. You don't, the trouble is you don't go and engage, I say you. Yeah. The chiefs don't go and ever talk to the people in A&E, mm -hmm. right? Who are there 24 hours, seven, right? They don't know what they're feeling, right? It's like that secret millionaire. How many, how many ever go back and actually wonder what it's like to be sitting there? You know, when I was clerking patients, uh, I get at the John Rackers when I was at SHO there, you might have got you know, 24 in 12 hours. They're getting over 100 in 12 hours. It's just, you know, it's a dumping ground. Everybody's just going in because they don't want to do it. These people are completely algorithm driven. And these are bright, smart, intelligent people and they're being treated like an algorithm. Okay, so, so, okay, so, sorry, so, so what, culture. So, it isn't, but it isn't just the consultants, the basic scientists. We're not good at reaching out and applying our stuff. So in practical terms, what we should do. So, you know, one thought might be, it's just a suggestion that our PhD students in biochemistry, chemical biology, whatever, do internships with you guys in the clinic in, in this sort of field, just to get, because I don't think there is a divide between the two there cultures. Isn't. There is. Just, and the there senior is. people have to just find a way to knowledge exchange, if you like. To, yeah, to and it starts with the younger, the younger folks. Um, the young doctors, I mean, they don't even need stethoscopes now. They'll use it all on, on an app. Right? In Stanford, people are putting it on, tells you the rate, the rhythm. Please listen to things. You know, you put on little ends and it forms a little ultrasound. They'll look back at us in years to come. What did they put around their heads? It's like, you know, if, if you ever, in some parts of the world, where they don't have ultrasound for, for, for babies. They still have to use that thing that they listen to the mother's abdomen. Yeah. And when they're put into museums, I mean, they're never going to use stethoscopes again. So the young... If I was a young doctor again, I'd go into those areas that are massively interesting, not just the data, but the technology-driven areas, because you can't answer the questions till you've got the technology, and then you need a damn good team that have got damn good questions. Single cell sequencing revolutionized. The human cell atlas will revolutionize, I think, the way we think about medicine. But in the end, you've got to love the people who are working with you. So who has to love the people? So is it, is it, uh, if the professors have to go and love the junior doctors and tell them they're worth so well. clinical professors? Yeah. 
but but also I mean, in my experience when you get often the doctors that go it literally goes and they're massively overwhelmed and if you go and speak science to them they actually love it because it's a great thing to break from doing that so and can i don't know i've got my to give you an example i've got sort of tinnitus from one ear you go and speak to the specialist the science behind that is really interesting Ooh. there's a basic research problem to work out how the brain's connected so i don't think there's a connect it's up to us as a community to innate, and it has to be young people as well. It's not going to be us. If you're going to address some of these problems, it needs people to work on it. So I like the polemical answer, but you needed money, you said. So what is the money for funding, which is engaged? Okay, so that, that I'm going to tell you a, a nasty little truth, and I apologize very profusely here. I was born in the Caribbean. I'm a colonial, right? We had a joke. You could tell an Englishman from, and I should say Great Britain rather than English, Great Britain person from a United States person, because outside the house is a Rolls Royce. And the American passes by and says, one day I'll have a car like that. And the UK person says, it's not fair that that person has a car like that. It's a cultural thing. And what I want to change is, it's nothing wrong with being entrepreneurial. There's nothing wrong in trying to make money, but do it in a socially contextual way and utilize the NHS to make money. Nothing wrong with that, right? But the trouble is when we have the British public Look at the Royal Free scandal, right? Google come in, they pay some money to get some information about dialysis things. The whole country goes up in arms. Oh, the NHS is charging the money, selling out the data. If you gave the data to the patients, they would own it. And the irony is we do that when people are pregnant, right? If those of you are ladies who've ever been pregnant in the UK, you get your notes given to you. And guess what? They get taken back when you're ended. So why can't we give all the data to the patients? Let them have that. They have the power. Right? Don't worry about all this you know, data protection. Well, the youngsters just give the data away all the time to Google and to, uh, and to Microsoft. Um, so I, I think you know, it, it's not beyond the, the realm of man to solve these problems out. But as Chaz, who's a great mentor of mine, it's about the culture that's empowered. And you've got to deal with the people that you have with you and actually make them see that there's a different way of doing things. I'm sorry, I get a bit passionate. <laughs> Chris, that was an awesome presentation. So, I mean, I think we all buy in that if you can isolate the cells, then study them. And it's amazing what we can, what data we can extract from one cell these days. Uh, secondly, you talked about the benefits of imaging, whole body imaging. And of course, that's just getting cheaper and cheaper, etc. But of course, there are many diseases in these elderly patients that we can't access cells. So is it acceptable just to get some sort of surrogate of activity in those brain or whatever to measure sort of blood-borne biomarkers or even some of the wearable devices? Because I just think these readouts now are so cheap that I think it's worth a shot. The wearable devices are very interesting. I just finished this trial actually with GSK was the sponsor of an anti-GMCSF rheumatoid arthritis, and there was a wearable device. So one of the problems with rheumatoid arthritis is we ask the patients how much early morning sickness have you got? How on earth are they going to know? How do I know? But a wearable device tells you how well you slept, how many times you moved over in bed. It's quantifiable. So that's all I would say is measure, 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 and use measurements that are robust. It doesn't really matter what. Then intervene with something. You might need 20 interventions, but finally you'll get somewhere you agree that you're going to use the same readouts over and over again. And so actually when it comes to these cellular therapies, I think we should be collaborating with our American colleagues to use the same readouts in ants when you're using far T cell therapies, for example. What are the readouts we're going to use? Because when I speak to Novartis and Roche, they want to make sure that we're using the same readout in exactly the same setting. Not as we were hearing earlier, but the trouble is the 40 patients done this way, another 40 done this way. How about doing 400 in exactly the same way, using the same intervention, but collecting funds from that? Then I think you might crack it. I don't know. I mean, I, I've only thought of how we do this information. That would require 20 years of anti-TNF and a certain way. We're late to tea, I know that, but I think this is a good discussion, right? So, uh, okay, we'll carry on. I'm getting in trouble here. <laughs> yeah, you, tea is not. Tea, tea is never, not, not, not the British like tea. Yeah, yeah. 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 Came from these failures. I 
about it with, with behavior. Hash seconds, an ethical computer, dose escalation. It's not like a maximum dose. It's absolutely sure you're not going to be So in our studies, usually the regulations will allow you a one month post to the drug. And you use the highest dose for that patient, that group of patients who buy from the corner market, has the drug got in to that group. And that's a question. important question. And yet, in most trials, because of the rush to get the drug to market, they never interrogate the people. It's all done in the blood. So in this MDGSSS study I was doing, um, very sadly, we went initially, it was week three, start cut injection. The calculations had been done from IV, because they GSK bought out the drug. They did this CK and DK on the, on the blood, not realizing actually the tissue in women's cell would express huge amounts of that MDGSSS. So it switched from week three, start cut every other week, and we lost efficacy because actually it hadn't got to the tissue. And instead of being 220 patients worldwide, probably I don't know how many million, we could have told them that in six patients. The biopsy before and after. Of course, that's pathology and pathology. Yes. Pharmacology and pathology. That's the future. Uh, I, I could, I'm a chemist, and I completely agree with you. Massively understand the pathology. I'm doing detailed biochemistry and pharmacology. Is that the, what experimental medicine is? That's, that's where we got penicillin, this plastic. Exactly. Aspirin. That's what the Good British time. are good at doing. Oh, we should bloody well do it. <laughs> <laughs> and money won't be a problem. Three hundred. We're spending thirty billion on a train line. We don't need. So <laughs> <laughs> if we get the politics right, and Kylian Mbappe's worth a billion. So if we get the politics right, money won't be a problem. But it's cool to do pathology, and often it gives.